All right, it's time to begin this morning. And as always, good to see everybody in the house of the Lord on this wonderful Sunday morning. And uh, it's just a good day, but it's a good day to worship the Lord. Amen? Amen. I hope that you came ready to receive from Him. If you bow your heads, let's begin our service with prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you, God, for this opportunity, not just to be in your house, but, God, to be with your people. And I pray, God, that this morning that the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit would reach down, move upon every heart of every person. God, we're all here. We all have needs. But, God, you're able to meet each and every need, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We give you praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, put your hands together. Let's worship him this morning. Amen. This is mine and Pastor Brian's favorite song. So you probably heard it before, but you're going to hear it again later anyway. So. <laughs> Well, years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died. everything. Now I gladly, I gladly own him as my king. My raptured soul can only sing of Calvary this morning. Amen. That's why I love this song. Such a testimony. And it's everybody's testimony if you go through those lyrics. Amen. You've heard the story of Paul and Silas 
Come and worship him this morning. Yes. Ushers, would you come? We're going to receive the tithe and offering that supports the ministry of this church. And, uh, and again, we thank you so much for continuing to be uh, faithful in giving and obedient to the word of the Lord. Bow your heads and your hearts at this time. Heavenly Father, again, we're grateful for this opportunity to give back to you, Lord. We worship you in giving. And, Lord, we realize that this morning... We would have nothing if it wasn't for you, Lord. And we ask you to take this offering, Lord, bless it. God, I ask you to bless the gift and giver. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. 
seated in the house of the Lord this morning. Again, we thank you so much for being here. Welcome you and home, and our uh, those that are watching live, we welcome you as well. And again, it's just a, it's a good day in the Lord. I encourage you to continue to worship the Lord. And, and you know, He is worthy of your praise. He's worthy of all of your praise. And, and uh, so just give, to, it's an opportunity to give to the Lord this morning in doing that. Brother Troy, would you come? Man, our Wednesday night class report, our primary class had five in attendance. Uh, and they're, they're doing a monthly uh, subject, and it's fill, fill Our Vessels. Children's Church is nine in attendance, and they Fruit of the Spirit. Teens had 16, and adults had 33, and they was in our Romans class. Uh, it was a little short this, this past Wednesday. Everybody on vacation was... Five or six families short, but we had a total of 63. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Amen. Yes. Everybody, everybody was out on spring break, but we're getting back in the swing of things now. So I want to encourage you this Wednesday night to, to come back. We're going to pick right back up in our Romans class. And uh, so continue to bring you something to write with, to take some notes, because it's, it's, it's food that you need. It's things that you need and uh, to... To, as we invest in your Christian walk to show you how, 
to live for the Lord on a daily basis. So, uh, so Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, going to pick right back up with that. All right, April the 2nd, Children's Church uh, is having their connection night here at the church for at, uh, at 3 to 5. So keep that in mind. Also, right around the corner, Brother Torrance Nash and Mario both will be here uh, for the weekend of April the 8th, 9th, and 10th. Now, that Friday night will be uh, a youth rally. Brother Mario is going to preach that uh, that youth rally. And so, uh, kids, invite all that you can. And again, I, I can't stress this enough. If anybody, any kid or any child that needs a ride, please let us know. We will make it happen to get them here. And uh, we have a bus, and uh, we, will, we will run the wheels off of it if we need to. But we will get... Uh, we need to get kids here if they can at all, and uh, but it's not just for the kids, adults. You'll be blessed also as well. You don't want to miss these services this weekend or that weekend of the April 9th, tenth, eighth, uh, ninth, and tenth. And of course, Torrance will be uh, preaching uh, Saturday night, and then of course uh, both services on Sunday. So be praying about that revival. Uh, I don't really got to tell you what you're getting. You already know you're going to be getting the word. And you're going to be blessed indeed. So uh, keep that in mind and be praying uh, for that weekend as well. I want to say we had a wonderful time yesterday at the horse show. I mean, we had a great turnout. Everything just went well. Uh, a big thanks to Jamie and Kaylee Hill for, for all the effort, the work. Yes, yes. <clears throat> Um, it, it's you, you don't you have no idea the work and the effort the planning that goes into something like this to to try to, for, to make it happen, and it was a wonderful success. The ladies done a a bait sale as well, so we want to thank all the ladies for the uh, what they did in that. But we have a grand total yesterday of what we raised that goes right directly into the building fund offering, and a grand total was. Uh, $1,117, and we thank God for that. Yes, it was great, great time. The kids had a good time. We found out who rides double and who don't. And uh, But we they had a great, great time, and it just went good. And I want to thank everybody that had a hand in helping out yesterday. Uh, it was just, uh, like I said, we, it was a beautiful day for it, just a great, great time, and and uh, we enjoyed it. So, all right. Now, we need candy for Easter egg hunt. That will be here for Easter uh, that Sunday afternoon. Uh, they're going to have an uh, Easter egg hunt for the kids. So it is time to start bringing in candy. And we need individually wrapped candy uh, is what they need. They put this in the plastic eggs and uh, for the kids to find. So uh, if, you, if you can, if you buy the dollar store, buy Walmart, you can pick up a bag of candy. That is individually wrapped. Please bring it. We'll have a tub uh, set up to put that in. And uh, so uh, it is time to start bringing that in. All right. Tonight, i uh, got a special treat for you. Sister Jenny Douglas, and uh, it will be here. She's going to be uh, ministering tonight at the service. We're excited about this. Uh, she pastors a church down uh, in Wynn. And uh, so she's going to, she'll be here tonight. A service will be 5 o'clock. Prayer meeting will be 430 and so come, find you a place to pray. And I, I, there, there's always, we, we have been having some great turnouts for prayer meeting. And there's a time, there's a need for people to pray. There's a need for families to pray. And uh, parents, it's a good time for you to, uh, to, to show your children how important prayer is. And, you know, as they see you, or as families come and pray together at the altars and and there, there is just a, a dire need, not just for in our families, but our, our community needs prayer. Our country needs prayer in a bad way. And so uh, find you a place to pray. We meet here about 4.30, and we, we, we uh, pray, and, you know, 10 or 15 minutes or whatever until the last one's done praying. And then somewhere around quarter till, we'll open up the doors as other people start coming in. But it's just a good time to pray. So I encourage you to come at 4.30 and, uh, for a prayer meeting. And, of course, service will start at 5 o'clock. May God bless you. Continue to let him minister to you this morning. I want Hannah to come. She's going to bless you in song.
Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all in ceiling. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Cause he makes a way with the rain away. He rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let my Jesus change your life. the Lord. My, if you're saved in the house this morning, you ought to be thankful for your salvation. And it ought to be something inside of you to want to tell somebody about what Jesus has done for you. Amen. We're going to dismiss our children to go to Children's Church at this time. Primary class as well. I want them to come back. We're going to continue to worship. Would you stand again across the building? I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer this morning because we know that He's still a healer. We know that nothing is impossible 
with the Lord this morning. And if you have a need, you want to need a touch in your body, we will invite you to come and let us gather around and pray one for another this morning. Go ahead, brother. Well, I know you had me on your mind when you died upon that hill. Oh, you saw me with the eternal life while I Worship him. Every Let's worship.
Raise your hands this morning. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because He first loved me. Oh, how I love. you love Jesus this morning? Yes. Amen. Thank you, singers and musicians, for your help this morning. I want to say it's good to have all of you here, and we appreciate you coming out. we still got a few that's out, but most of everybody is back, and it's good to see you this morning, and we're glad that you came to the house of the Lord uh, today. If you want to grab your Bibles, I'll save you an up and down. We're going to be going to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter number 23. And uh, looking at verses 20 through 30, Exodus chapter number 23, looking at verses 20 through 30, we're also, I didn't give it to you, but I just decided to, to look at one scripture in Joshua, Joshua uh, 1 and 3 also. But Exodus is where we will start. While, they, while everybody is turning there in Exodus and getting situated there, I want to uh, just quickly announce that on Thursday nights, we are, uh, we started a new, is it going to, we started a new uh, panel on Thursday nights, and uh, the panel on Thursday nights is just simply uh, explaining the message of the cross and defining the message of the cross. While we're defining the message of the cross, we're uh, having some trouble here. <laughs> Give me some honors. Trying to work through it. All right. While we're explaining the message of the cross, we, we had a lot of we had a lot of uh, good comments last Thursday night. It's something that we continue. Brother Lane joined us also. Something that we're going to continue, and it's something that we may ask some of you to uh, at different times to join us to kind of testify. You know, I I am as a as a church as a believer. I understand and I realize that I, I am better than nobody. I'm not better than anybody. But there's a message that's changed my life. 
And that is the message of the cross. And the message of the cross is something that is not explained everywhere in every church. And so uh, on these Thursday nights, we're going to take some time and define it and kind of comb through it. Thank you to all that listened. Thank you to all that shared. And uh, we just appreciate it very much. And it's something that we plan on continuing on. So if you could share it, it would, it would just help get the word out uh, to somebody that hear it. That's how I heard it at first, and uh, that's why that it was delivered at Faith Worship Center. So you never know what you're going to do by sharing uh, the message of the cross, and so that's a great opportunity to do so. Let's get started. Exodus chapter number 23, we start in verse 20. This is familiar to, to most of you, and I hope familiar to all of you before we're done today. Exodus chapter number 23, verse number 20. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place where I have prepared. Beware of him, and he obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if you shall indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto your enemies and an adversary unto your adversaries. For my angel shall go before you and bring you in, in unto the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do, in, do after their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and quite break down their images." You shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. There shall nothing, there shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in your land. The number of your days I will fulfill. I will send my fear before you, and I will destroy all the people to whom you shall come, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs unto you. I will send the hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivite and the Canaanite and the Hittite from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beast of the field multiply against you. By little and little, I will drive them out from before you until you be increased and inherit the land. And I'll read that again. By little and little, I will drive them out before you until you be increased and inherit the land. And we look at Joshua 1 and 3. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you. Well, I feel that this morning. As I said unto Moses, by little and little, but every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I give unto you. That's powerful this morning. I want to minister. I'm going to try to slow down and teach just a little. But I want to minister the thought by little and little. Will you bow your head and will you help me pray this morning? Father, I love you today. I thank you, God, for your grace and for your mercy and for your love. And I thank you, God, for the opportunity, Lord, to be here. Lord, for every individual that is here, God, every family that's represented, I'm, I'm thankful for each and every one. God, I'm asking you to open our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and anoint my lips, God, to deliver your already anointed word. Lord, I pray that you would do a work that I cannot do, and I'll be very careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in the name of Jesus Christ, and everybody says amen. Once again, because of the direction that we're headed today, uh, I feel it needful to back up just a moment and to, uh, to just recap just a little bit. Last Sunday morning was a great service for uh, the believer, for the church. There you found it. Turn it down just a little bit. For the believer and for the church. And because it was a great Sunday morning because there was so many that raised their hand to accept Jesus Christ. Amen. Any time that we can have somebody born again, every any time that somebody that was once headed directly to a devil's hell that changes their mind and accepts Jesus for their Savior, and we have something to rejoice about. Amen? Amen. Amen. And I'm thankful for that. And I, I, I want to recap just briefly because I can't rightfully enter into where I want to be unless I recap just a little bit. 
I came to you from Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 1, and, and again, even though I'm recapping, the question is still good. The question still applies today, but in Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 1, he tells us, he brought it up, we'll look at it, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And my question is this, do you have peace with God? Do you have peace with God? Because that should be the most important thing in our heart and in our life is, do I have peace with God? And the way that we have peace with God is that we have to be justified, and uh, living for God is really not even relevant if we're not justified by our faith, and so we got to look at that first. If I have peace with God, it literally means that I've been justified, and watch this, I'm justified by My faith, not what I do, not what I've earned, not what I work for, but I'm justified, I'm declared not guilty by my faith. Last Sunday, as it is this Sunday, heaven's courtroom is wide open this morning. You don't have to wait for a court date, you don't have to wait for a certain time, and you don't have to call a lawyer. All you have to do is enter in boldly by the grace of God and enter into heaven's courtroom. I can approach the judge, God the righteous judge, place my faith in Christ, and I don't have to fear the verdict. I know that my verdict will be not guilty according to what Jesus has done for me on the cross of Calvary. Amen. I'm thankful this morning. I'm justified. Are you justified this morning? I've been declared not guilty. My name is in the Lamb's book of life. I haven't seen it, but I believe somewhere up there is a robe that's made just specifically for me. A crown that will fit my head and nobody else's. I I believe it this morning that I have the gift of eternal life and I will live, I will abide with Jesus Christ forever and forever because I'm not guilty this morning. Praise the Lord. I'm thankful for that. So when we look at that, I left you with that. I want to add on to that from here is that justification is not only, watch this, it's not only the verdict or the declaration off of my life, but now it's become my position. Are you with me? It's my position. I stand before God this morning being justified. I don't stand being perfect. Don't get them confused. I am seen as perfect or I am seen as sanctified in the eyes of God, but sanctification is both instant and progressive. Instantly God sees me as, as, as uh, let me say, He sees me as clean, He sees me without sin, but I'm still in the flesh, so I have a progressive work of being sanctified or being changed. Let me tell you something this morning. The evidence that we have been justified and placed in this position is that we are being changed. Jesus didn't come in and leave you like he found you. So we're being changed. So just for illustration, I was here in the muck and the mire of of sin. And when I was justified, he raised me up and he brought me to a position now seated in heavenly places. I am 147 times. Your New Testament says we're in Christ. I am inside of Jesus Christ. This is my position. I'm not perfect. I've not arrived. But I'm justified. And look, I don't mean this in the wrong way, but I don't know how else to say it. I said it Thursday night. I don't know how else to say it. But now that I'm justified, I wish somebody would have told me this uh, when I was growing up. Now that I'm justified, the fear of if I'm saved, the fear of am I going to hell, the fear of all of this because I fell. Listen, I'm justified. My position, even though I'm going to fail, Here's religion. I feel really. Even though I'm going to fail, even though I'm not perfect, as long as I keep my faith in Christ and what He did on the cross of Calvary, this position don't change. <laughs> did you get saved by what you do? Then how do we lose it by what we do? I place my faith in Christ and what He did on the cross of Calvary, and I enter in. To a justified, well, that's one saved, always saved. Well, yes and no. Once you're saved, you're always saved as long as you keep your faith in Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary. 
But once you are saved, you can come to the place where you no longer believe. And if you come to the place you no longer believe, you've lost your salvation. But here's what do I do with failure? I promise I'm getting to my text. What do I do with failure? I messed up. I did something wrong. I said something wrong. I, I had a, a wrong action. My attitude got the best. My temper flew off. What do I do? Well, now that I'm saved, I'm in a justified position. I say, God, I just messed up. And what I just did, I know you don't approve of. So I'm asking you to forgive that in me, and I'm asking you to change that in me. Now I'm being sanctified because before you know it, my bad temper is not so bad. My attitude is not the same attitude I had. My mouth and the way I talk will clean up. The places that I desire to go will change. The people that I desire to hang out with will, well, let me tell you something. They'll drop you before you drop them. They'll drop you away before you don't. God made that one easy. And so here's where we're at. I'm in a position of being justified. Okay? So where do I go from there? How am I changed? The the Bible teaches that this is a whosoever gospel. It means that anybody and everybody can be free from anything and everything by being justified by our faith. Now, I'm justified. I'm in the position. We got to learn how to walk with the Lord. And we've got to have it reinforced over in us over and over and over and over again. Because growing up, I said it Thursday night, I guess I'm repeating some of that, I didn't know how to live for God. I was just trying to live on credit from Sunday to Sunday, just try to make it to the next Sunday so that I could repent again. Because I messed up, well, you can't go a whole week without doing something wrong. No, and you can't either. Do you realize one wrong, one wrong thought? One wrong thought? Come on. One wrong thought is evidence that there's something in your heart that is not yet lined up with what God requires. And if that wrong thought comes, well, nobody knew about it. Well, here's something you may not know. <laughs> God knew about it. Yeah, he did. It wasn't, there's no surprise with God. It didn't surprise him. It, 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 God knew about it. He's fully aware of it. He knows what kind of mess I better preach to me that I am more than I know myself. And so God knew about it. So what do I do with this? Monday through Saturday, I was just trying to make it till Sunday, hoping that the Lord didn't come back because I knew, I, I believed I was dying and going to hell. So I was praying the Lord didn't come back so I could get somewhere and say, my God, forgive me for what I've done. Forgiveness, look, if you're going to be a good Christian, you better learn how to repent. And you don't have to wait till Sunday to do that. Because the correct action of a believer is the moment that I mess up. See, a non-believer doesn't care. They just keep going. I got a message this week and said, uh, the question was this. I I still have such a pool of sin, and I feel dirty and rotten all over. Am I born again, or am I not born again? That was the question that I got as a private message. And I said, let me ask you a question. Did you feel bad before you come to Jesus, uh, all of these pools of sin that you had? They said, oh, absolutely not. I enjoyed it. I said, you know why you feel bad now? Because you're saved. The convicting power of the Holy Spirit is there telling you that's wrong and that you need to surrender it to the Lord. And the believer does not ignore that. The believer says, my God, I am a mess. I am a wreck. I'm asking you to forgive me and change this in me. And the Holy Spirit continues to work on us and continues to change us. And this doesn't ever quit. I don't care if you pastor the church for 75 years. This doesn't ever quit. As long as we're in the flesh, we will always be in a position that we need to depend upon the Lord. Everybody with me? Pretty foundation, foundational teaching. I know religion would cast that out. I had a pastor a friend of mine, an evangelist. He said, man, I was preaching that same thing one time at a church, and a, and a lady in the back, she, she very loudly, when it got quiet, she spoke up and said, speak for yourself. Listen, I mean no disrespect, but I am speaking for myself, and I'm speaking for all of mankind. 
Unless you're deity, unless you're God, we're always going to be in a place where we depend upon the Lord. We're not per- perfect. Sinless perfection is not in the Bible. So we're dependent upon God. So what do I do? How do I live for God? How are things changed in me? I'm giving you the how. And I want to tell you this, and we mentioned it again. I've, I've referred several times on Thursday night. I guess I enjoyed it more than anybody. But I, I want to tell you this. We do not have the things in our heart that needs to be changed by what we do. The things in our heart are changed by what we believe. Even if it's biblical things. Now, listen, and don't throw stones at me, but reading our Bible and praying and fasting doesn't change things in our heart. But what it does is build our faith in Jesus Christ who is able to change us. So I want my faith to be built. My, I want to learn to trust Him more. I want to learn to depend upon Him more. So I pray and I study and I, and I fast and I'm faithful to the house of God. Why? I need my faith in Christ and what He did on the cross of Calvary to be invested in and built up so that I would believe more and not less. Look, we're in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night is our opportunities right now to be in church. You're in the world Monday through Saturday. Don't tell me, don't tell me that you don't need your faith invested in. You live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And so here's where we're at. Two things I want to point out here. Let's go to verse number 20. Verse number 20 says this. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and bring you into the place where I have prepared. Now, here's two things I want to point out. I'll jump to the second one first. Teenagers, please hear me. Not just teenagers, but everybody. But listen, first thing that we see in this scripture, or one of the things we see is that the Lord was going to bring us in the place that he has prepared. I want to tell you this. That literally means that God has a plan for your life. To bring Israel into a place that he has prepared, he looked way down the road. See, here's what we can't see. God is looking down on our life as a big picture. He sees the beginning from the end. He's looking at a big picture. He knows the direction you need to go. He knows the directions you don't need to go. He knows the, uh, the, the opportunities you need to take, and he knows the opportunities that we need to pass on because the devil will make them look good sometimes. And as he's looking at our life as a big picture, as he said here, a place that I have prepared for you. Listen, teenager, God has prepared a plan just for your life. If you will follow that plan, you'll be happy. You'll look back and say, thank God, I followed his plan. If you don't follow that plan and you follow your plan, you're going to find a life that is full of trouble. Next thing I want to point out here is also not only God has a plan, but he has a God for his plan. He has somebody to guide us into his plan, the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's common today. Sometimes we say it not thinking about it. But much of the church will say, well, I know it was the Lord because he opened the door. I know it was God because this happened. That's not new covenant. devil can open a door too. I know it's God because everything fell in place. You don't think the devil can do that? We know it was the Lord because he's got a God. The new covenant way is the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, I want to talk to you. You know why many believers don't want to go that route? Because in order to find the voice and to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, we've got to get alone and spend some time in a prayer closet somewhere and give God time to talk to us. We get in a hurry. We look for a sign. We look for a door to be open and all of this. And we just take our opportunity. And I'm just going to be blunt because sometimes we're too lazy to spend some time on our knees and saying, my God, I need to hear your voice. New covenant way is the God, the Holy Spirit, saying, I want to talk to you. I'll lead you, but it's going to be by my voice. And so that's the two things. He's prepared a way, and his voice is there to God. It's verse number 21. 
Beware of him and obey, obey his voice. Provoke, provoke him not, for he will not pardon transgression, for my name is in him. Listen, I was on this a few weeks ago, but one thing you don't want to do when the Holy Spirit is leading you is to say, no, nah, and I'll just go my own way or move my faith to, some, to self and go ahead and do my own thing. What happens? Galatians 20 and 21 happens. I have frustrated the grace of God. That means I've cut off the only help that God has given me. If you cut off the only help that God has given you, you are wandering and you'll find yourself in a place that we don't want to be. Amen. All right. To not obey him is to not trust him, but to trust his direction. It's like, again, the big picture, looking down on the corn maze, looking down on the maze and which way to turn. He's looking down. He'll tell you, go left, go right. He'll tell you which way to go. We've just got to follow him. And if we don't obey him, we'll be in a mess. Verse 22. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thy enemies and an adversary unto thy adversaries. Powerful, powerful promise. I have the Lord that will raise up a standard against my enemies. He will become an enemy to my enemies, an adversary to my adversaries, and anything at all, listen, I mean that, anything at all that tries to destroy you. Anybody ever been through a trial in here this morning? Anybody ever had your family attacked and everything else attacked and almost destroy you? I found my life broken in many different pieces. Listen, the Lord is saying anything that comes against you, I'm going to jump on your side and I'm going to be against whatever it is that is against you. I'm going to be an enemy to your enemies, an adversary to your adversaries. And let me tell you something this morning. With the Lord that is by your side, you are always a majority. And you always find yourself in the middle of a battle. Listen, I know it's big, but I'm going to say it because I believe it. You're smack dab in the middle of a battle that you cannot lose as long as you keep your faith in Christ. You can't lose if your faith is in Christ. If you lose, that means God lost. And he never lost a battle yet. Verse number 23. And I'll spend a couple of minutes here. Watch this. For mine angels shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Canaanite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. And I will cut them off. I like that. That word literally means cut them off. God's saying, I'm going to literally divorce them. I'm going to literally divorce them. In other words, I'm going to help them none. It's going to be as if they were never even in Canaan. I'm going to cut them off. Now, I want you to think about something. I want to slow down. I know we're a little quiet, but I want, I want to slow down. I want you to think about this. Because this morning, I mean, the Lord put this in my spirit. I got to believe that it's for somebody. We've been through a trial and we've been through tribulation. We have found ourselves in different storms and different trials. Different, different ones. I mean, my last trial is not like this trial, and my next trial not like that other trial. And sometimes we're like, okay, God, you, 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 if you try me in this area, okay, but I don't want you trying this area. All right? Seems like every area of our life is different. I want you to think about this. I always just kind of read through this, but got to doing a little bit of study and research, and I found some things that were helpful to me. The Amorite, the Lord said, first of all, I'm going to destroy the Amorite. What does that mean, destroy the Amorite? Well, yeah, they were a people, but here's something you need to know about the Amorite. The Amorites didn't really have a specific dwelling place. They were kind of like a chameleon. They could be anywhere and any time. They could just pop up without any warning. They could just show up, and the Amorites continued. Amorites would be strong, and then later on, down years down the road, the Amorites would come against Israel again, and later on down the road, they'd come against Israel again. It was just that, you know, Paul would say, the thorn in my flesh. Every time I turn around, I got an Amorite that is popping up. I want you to know that the Amorite here, they just never seem to quit. They never seem to quit. I told you earlier that as long as we're in the flesh, we will always be at a place that we're dependent upon the grace of God and upon the help of the Lord. The Amorite was a type of that trial. It just never seemed to fully go away. It was just kind of always there, and it's not something specific. It's just, let me just say it like this. Basically, as long as we are a believer, we will always have a, specific, or a, a certain type of trial that keeps us pushed and trusted 
trusting to the Lord. I've used this example, but if the big mean dog come in my yard when I was just a child playing in the yard and my dad is sitting on the front porch and that big mean dog come at me growling and snarling going to attack me, I'm running to my dad. Because I know once I get to my dad, everything is going to be all right. The Amorite was the type of the big mean dog that's just trying to push you to Jesus Christ. Come on. God knows what will make you pray. And so the Amorite was there. It was type of that trial. Here's the good thing about that. Even though the Amorites continued to pop up and to show their ugly head and to attack, every single time that Israel kept their faith in God, they found that they had victory over the Amorite. And it's the same for me and you today. Even though a trial will keep coming, as long as you keep your faith in Christ, God will never quit. If you won't quit, God won't quit. Victory will keep coming. Now watch this. The Hittite. The Hittite, mature believer will understand this. They literally dwelled in what they called urban enclaves. In other words, the Hittite was deep inside of another tribe. Are you with me? I know we're quiet, but I'm still going to stay slow and teach. They were deep inside another tribe. All of a sudden, I don't mean this disrespectful. Um, I'm just going to. I'm just going to say. Let's see. I'm trying to be careful. If you had a house full of dogs, and I hope you don't, but if you did. And you were going through there and you seen all these dogs. And all of a sudden, sitting up on the shelf, there's a cat. I wouldn't expect that. Especially because I know my dogs and my dogs don't like cats. I wouldn't expect that. No, I just, it would catch me off guard. The Urbans was the same kind. If I had a box full of Reese's that I just bought from the store and I'm reaching through there eating Reese's. Because I believe that recipe come from heaven. You had to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. They're just too good. And all of a sudden I'm reaching through there. And all of a sudden I pull out a Snickers. I'm not expecting that. Well the Hivites was like that. If you came into an area. And you knew or thought you knew what to expect. All of a sudden there's a Hivite that's dwelling in here. I didn't even know he was about the place. Me and Brother West was talking one day through the process of sanctification. If a person is walking in the Spirit, let me tell you what's going to happen. All of a sudden, there's going to be something that surfaces in your heart that you never knew was there. And it caught you off guard. You're thinking, where in the world did that come right? Come from? That's a Hivite. The Hivite was there, and they just stayed secluded. They just kind of mixed in. They never showed their head until they were truly disturbed. And let me tell you something. The Lord wants to disturb every part of your heart because the more of self that He can clean out is the more of the Holy Spirit that He can pour in, and we're being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. So we have the Amorite that keeps showing up, and we have the Hivite. I didn't even know he was there. And then we have the parasite. I like to say parasite, but parasite. The parasite lived in the open country. When they got over in the promised land, he said, here you go. Here's the open country. The open country was good for grazing livestock, animals and everything. But the parasite consumed that. They, they grazed their livestock. They had the good grass. They had all of this. So now he's saying, even in the open land, you're going to need that to graze your livestock. The parasite is there, and I'm going to clean all of the parasite out. Then he says this, the Canaanite. The Canaanite liked the Jordan, they liked the Jordan Valley. The Jordan Valley there was, uh, the, the, was a type of the good, the rich soil, where they could grow good crops. But the Canaanite was there. And the Lord said, I'm going to give you the Canaanite's land also that you, so that you can grow your crops. Watch this. Then there was the Hivite, the, I said Hittite, it was Hittite before, the Hivite. The Hivite liked the hills and the mountains. They dwell high on the hills and mountains. Everybody's thinking, what's this guy? got to do with anything. I promise I'll bring it together. They dwelled in the hills and the mountains and they needed that area too. So the Lord said, I'm going to give that to you. And the Jebusite 
dwelled in the land where they had the air, the chariots of iron, and they said, uh, in fact, Israel just camped around them. We don't want to disturb them. They were a type of the stronghold, and they was not conquered until David come along and said, why are you tiptoeing around the stronghold? God said we could have that land. I don't care if they got chariots of iron. We're going to conquer them too. And David destroyed them and they got the land of the Jebusite. Why did I bring all that out? I brought all that out to tell you this. God said the battle that continues to show up, I'll give you victory over. To the Hittite that's hidden deep down in your heart, I'm going to give you victory over. To the Perizzite that's got the open ground, you can have the open ground. To the Canaanite that's in the valley, I'll give you the valley. To the one that is in the Hivite that's in the mountain, I'll give you the mountain. And even the stronghold that is in your heart, I'll give you victory over. Listen, he's God of the mountain. He's God of the valley. He's God in the place. He is God of the stronghold this morning. He'll give you every bit of it. And didn't leave anything out. You know why I give them all this? Because they needed it all. I feel that in my spirit this morning. But even the stronghold. And I'm going to say we because I'm trying to learn to use pronouns that includes me and not just preach to people, but make sure I include myself as the writer of Hebrew does. Listen, those strongholds in our heart that we keep, te- we keep on tiptoeing around because, well, nobody really knows about them anyway. This is when I need to use I because it's just me. That stronghold that I keep tiptoeing around because nobody really knows about, sooner or later, I'm going to have to put my trust in my heavenly King David and say, God, I've tiptoed around that chariot of iron long enough. You said I could have that area and that territory also. So I place my faith in you and I'm going to trust you to break that stronghold. Listen, we serve God that's able to break every addiction and every bondage. He's greater than crystal methamphetamine. He's greater than Jack Daniels. He's greater than nicotine. He's greater than lust. He's greater than the bondage of homosexuality. He is greater than a gossiping tongue, a fornicator, or the desire to adulterer. I want you to know God is God that is able to break all of it. Amen. Amen. So we see this and we understand this. Every place that the sole of my feet shall tread upon, God will give me the mountain. He'll give me the valley. He'll give me the stronghold if I'll just keep my trust and my faith in Him. Look at verse 24 and 25. He says this, Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them and quite break down their images. And you shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water and take sickness away from thee in the midst of thee. This verse, these two verses here is a promise that God would supply all of their need, and God will supply all of our need according to his riches and glory. Listen to what I'm about to say. Even in... A tough economy. I don't mean this disrespectful, and I, even if you're watching live and you don't know me, I'm not meaning this in a wrong way. But when I talk about the economy, I mean this. I don't care if a Democrat is in office. I don't care if a Republican is in office. When I'm living under God's economy, I'm going to believe and trust God. Yeah, I may have to sacrifice. I may have to do without. But I'm not going to do without the things that I, that I need. Because God will supply each and every one of them. The believer will not be without the things that they need. Verse number 26. There shall nothing cast their young nor be barren in your land. The number of your days I will fulfill. How many has ever received a promise from God? How many has ever God promised you something in your heart and it's still there and not seen it fulfilled yet? I want you to look at this verse. This verse literally means there shall nothing cast their young. It means a miscarriage. We have moms in here. 
ladies in here today that has suffered from miscarriage. I'm not trying to bring up hurtful feelings. I'm trying to explain the text. They suffer from a miscarriage. You know what a miscarriage is when life was there and all of a sudden it's taken. No warning. No heads up. It was there. And all of a sudden it's taken. I never forget our friends. They won't care me telling it at all, even if they watch later, or I would I would say nothing. One of the saddest things I've was ever seen. Jesse and Mariah Mandito from Springfield, Missouri. They now live in Baton Rouge. Was following along with their her first pregnancy. We were in close contact. In fact, she was. They were coming down here, son. As we followed them along, they've stayed at our house. They're just good friends of ours. Following along, and Jesse calls me one night, and it's we've been talking, and she's eight months along. And she said, or he said, man, we're not finding a heartbeat in our baby. I said, you, I was just flabbergasted. But I thought everything was great. He said, everything has been great. He said, please pray. And he said, I want you to pray God's will because we don't know what the deal is. As hard as that is for me to tell you as a dad, he said, pray for God's will. And the baby passed away and we, he called us and asked us to come do that funeral and we went up. Saddest thing I said, I, br- I got a point to this. I'm not trying to bring up hurtful feelings. But I watched him go to the back. Of, they were going to carry the child to the grave site and he went over and stopped them, and he said, no, I'll carry him. I'll be the one carrying him. It looked like one of them little, and I know it wasn't, but like a, just a little styrofoam white cooler. And I know it wasn't. It was a little casket, but that's what it looked like when he first looked. And he picked it up, and he brought it over and set it by the graveside. And looked at me and wiped a tear, and he said, go ahead. He said, go ahead. And my first thought was, how in the world is this man and this woman this strong? I'm a believer too, but listen, (laughs) unless you faced it, you don't know how you're going to react. How are they this strong? I asked him before, I said, what do you want me to, (laughs) something specific you want me to tell him? He said, yeah, I want you to tell him why things like this happen. I want you to tell him that death came because of the entrance of sin. I want you to tell them that Jesus died to save us from all of this. And I said, man, I don't know what else to say but that. He said, just tell them. So I told them. And we got through all of that. And I, I remember thinking, I'll get to my point. How in the world, I, I, how, how in the world would this feel to this mom and this dad, gut-wrenching? This scripture is comparing this with that moment. For the Lord to give you a promise that you know, listen, a lot of people claiming promises and they're not of God, but a promise that you know is of the Lord, and all of a sudden, the enemy has just ripped that promise away from you. See, what happens is that promise begins to grow and you start to get excited about what God's going to do. You start to build up, you get anxious because of what God's going to do. I start to envision my family sitting with me on the pew if that's what I've been praying for. I start to envision uh, me being completely be made whole and no longer sick if that's what God has promised me. I start, uh, I start envisioning what my marriage is going to be like when God restores that marriage if that's what God is promising you. And then all of a sudden God makes you the promise, says, just hold still. I'm working on behind the scenes and I will fulfill that promise. And then all of a sudden the enemy comes in and rips that desire out of you. He says this, there shall not nothing. 
cast their young. No more miscarriages. Not only that, you're not even going to be unbearing. You will be productive. You will produce the promise. In other words, what the Lord is saying to Israel and what He is saying here, I'm promising you long life. And during that long life that I'm promising you, I'm going to give you other promises. And I'm telling you this, and don't claim it if God hadn't said it to you specifically. He's saying this, your family will come in. Your marriage will be restored. You will be healed and made whole. I will give you this. And nothing is going to take it away from you. I like that a lot better. Nothing's going to take it away. Because God has given that promise. Then he goes on, he says this. Verse number 27. I will send my fear before you, will destroy all the people to whom you shall come. I will make all of your enemies turn their backs unto you. And verse number 27, watch this. It's the Lord that will destroy and drive out. If I just believe and continue to believe, even though I may face them, he will destroy each and every one of them. Israel was not warriors. They were not fighters. But the Lord fought each and every one of them. I think about the song. I'm going to mess it all up because I just cannot, for some reason, remember words of the song. And Sister Sherry will always be known as singing of little David. I know Hannah's been singing it. But David said, the battle's not mine. Said little David, Lord, it's thine. I bid your favor. I've given it all to you because I know not what to do. Help me. You don't know. Huh? I can't hear her, so... Uh, let me just sum it up by saying this. <laughs> David gave the battle to the Lord, and the Lord was able to make a way. He said, you're really all that I need. The battle's not mine. He gave it to the Lord. Verse number 28. He says this, I'm trying to hurry. I don't want to bore you. And I will send hornets before you which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before you. Hornets before you. I don't know about you, but that'd do it for me. I hate anything that flies and goes, Zzz. it'll drive me plumb out, I promise you. Anything that God needs is at his disposal. Whatever God needs to do to bring about your promise, whatever thing that God needs to bring about your miracle, everything is at his disposal. Sometimes it's blessing, sometimes he needs to send a trial. But the Lord knows what he needs to do in order to bring us closer. Verse number 29. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field multiply against you. In other words, he leaves it there so that we are continued to be dependent upon God. Never, God never plans on us coming to a place that we're not dependent upon him. Always be dependent upon the, on the Lord. And verse number 30, and I'll hush. He says this, by little and little, I will drive them out from before you until you be increased and inherit the land. In verse number 30, by little and little, it literally means this, that God is going to parcel, parcel things out of our heart. You see, if we got a good picture of our heart this morning, we quit. We'd all give up because we, I better say I, I'm a mess. I'm a wreck. And if we got a good picture of our heart this morning, we'd say it's no use. He's saying this, I'm going to parcel some things out. I'm going to give you one section. Let's go to the plain first. And then we'll go to the mountain. And then we'll go down in the valley. And then we'll talk about that stronghold. He's just going to say this. Think about, let's talk about the attitude first. Then we'll talk about the tongue. Then we'll talk about your temper. Then we'll talk about the lust of the heart. Parcel some things out and watch. By little and little, I will bring you into that land. The process, he means for this to be increased. And he talks about until you be increased, he literally means to be fruitful. Church, if you're a believer this morning and you're not fruitful, 
then we're not walking in the Spirit. That can't just be a term. We've got to explain, but we're not walking in the Spirit if we're not being fruitful. Fruit ought to be being produced in our heart and in our life. The process is by faith in Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary, and the result is fruit is being produced by little and little, and I end with this. As a believer, I'm not perfect. I'm not come to the place where I am have arrived. But I am in a position, because I'm justified, I'm in a p- position by which God can change me. And if I'm in that position, I will be being changed. And the change is, is, is that he's going to make me fruitful. He's going to cause me to produce fruit. I shouldn't be the same man today that I was six months ago. I shouldn't be. I told you all about that one time that I had to apologize to my wife. Yes, one time. That's all I told you about. These things, we should be being changed and being altered. So how am I changed? Now that I'm in justified. I keep my faith in Christ and what he did for me on the cross of Calvary. And the Holy Spirit, verse 23, or verse 20, there to lead me and guide me. He's talking to me about things in my life that needs to be changed. And as long as I follow his voice, every place that the sole of my feet shall step upon, he will give me the mountain. He will give you the valley. He'll give you the plain. He'll give you the stronghold. He'll uncover those things that's hidden within a trial. He'll continue to do it if you'll keep your faith in Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary. This is the process that God has laid out for his people to walk in his prescribed order of victory. If we're going to walk in victory, we've got to keep our faith in Christ so that the Holy Spirit will continue to do his work. This morning, will you stand with me? ask you to bow your head with me please across the building. Father we love you this morning. I'm thankful God for your word. I'm thankful Lord God that you did not leave us in a place of bondage but you said Lord that you would bring us out in every place that the sole of our feet would tread upon. God that you would give that to us as part of our inheritance. Lord I pray this morning in the name of Jesus that you would move upon somebody's heart Somebody's heart, God, that may just be standing, Lord, may just be frustrated. I'm asking you to remind, Lord, that every single promise that you have put there, Lord, that you can't make come to pass, that there will be no miscarriage with your promise, that there will be no putting away of your promise, but that it would be fulfilled, God, and that we would see it, Lord, to uh, God, to make it fruitful. I'm asking in the name of Jesus that you would move, Lord, upon the heart the life of your people, Lord, and we give you the praise and the glory for it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Here's my altar call this morning. It's very simple. Maybe you're here this morning. I've said a mouthful. Something of your, something the Lord has pricked your heart about or dealt with you about. Maybe it's God help me face this stronghold. Give me victory over the stronghold. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a a promise that's been deep down in your heart that you've allowed to be buried. I don't know what it is, but I just want to give us a moment this this morning to come around the altar and and just talk to the Lord. It's a good time to pray. It's a good time to say, God, help me with my walk. Help me to be changed and help me to be fruitful that I would be a light for you. Would you come this morning?
Well, it's just for a moment this morning. When Hallelujah. You think you just won't make it. Oh, and he is right there. When it looks like hope is lost. Oh, and you're going to find out that he's not the less than faithful. So keep holding on. So keep holding on. Sing it if you know it this morning. Hallelujah. Heart to cry. But he'll give you that mountain. He'll give you that valley. Hallelujah. Victories without body, but he said, Help. Amen. 
Amen and amen. I believe that this morning. Amen? Amen. Well, we want to thank you so much for being here on this Sunday morning. It's a beautiful day today. I invite you back tonight at 430 and a service at 5 o'clock. I just encourage you just to keep walking with the Lord. You've come too far. If it's been two minutes, you've come too far to turn back now. We'll keep trusting in the Lord for this morning. Amen. God bless you. Hope you have a great afternoon. We hope to see you back this evening ready to worship the Lord and, uh, and to just be in his service. Nathan, would you pray and dismiss this service?